In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today I have entitled my homily, Simeon and Anna, Two Seniors Who Bring Us Closer to God. Now for a Reader's Digest version of this homily, in case you need to snooze through it or leave, go out, get a cup of coffee, or place an early bet on the Super Bowl, I'm going to give you the summary. In this morning's Holy Gospel, we are introduced to two seniors who have something to teach us about our relationship with God. There it is. If you're going to heaven and St. Peter says, what did you do in your life but make it short, give him those two sentences and you are in for sure. Now many of us have seen children's prayers or read a number of children's prayers printed maybe in the Reader's Digest or some other venue of that ilk. One of my favorite goes like this. Dear God, when people die, you have to make new ones. So why don't you just keep the ones you have and you will not have to work so hard? Amen. Of course, we can laugh, but you know, if we've lost a loved one, we may be especially able to relate to such a prayer. And seriously, why this divine plan of built-in obsolescence, of old age, of becoming seniors? Well, on one level, of course, the answer to that is beyond our comprehension. We read in Isaiah, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, says the Lord, nor are your ways my ways? And in 1 Corinthians, St. Paul asks, who can know the mind of God? But let's look at this child's prayer through the lens of today's gospel passage. The story of the presentation of the Christ child in the temple includes three generations. Now, this can only happen because God continues to make new people, as the child put it in the prayer that we quoted. Mary and Joseph bring the infant Jesus to be presented in the temple, and there they meet two seniors, Simeon and Anna, just as the parents of the Christ child has something to learn from these two elders, so do we. So do you and me. First of all, there's Simeon. Now, Simeon had seen a lot of years. He was also a man on a mission, a very focused mission. He was looking for God's Messiah and did not want to die until he had realized that mission. Furthermore, the Holy Spirit had promised him that he would see Messiah before he died. However, for this to happen, Simeon had to do his part. He had to keep on looking. Simeon had to be an active seeker, an active searcher. He had to stay alert. He had to remain true to his mission. Now, Simeon teaches us that we, too, need to look inward for the Holy Spirit and that it takes some ongoing attention. It takes some actual elbow grease from all of us, some searching, some discernment. Now, it would be great if we could just sit in the pew every Sunday and have God's revelation just plop and drop in our laps and we'd be saved, no effort on our own. It would be great not going to happen. We need to take an active role in searching, in discerning, and in discovering God's Spirit, not only within ourselves, but within each other, and how those people relate to you and me. Now, you could pick up a prayer book, read a short prayer, put the prayer book back on the shelf, come to church a couple of times a month or maybe a year, sing a hymn now and then, it's not going to be enough. 
I mean, how many people send a Mother's Day card and figuring, as long as I send the card, then everything's going to be okay with my mother? No problem. That hallmark's going to do it. It's going to mend everything. It doesn't. We need to seek and search and take an active part in the building of that relationship. Now, you might say, well, I'm preaching to the choir. Not only that choir to my back, but this choir to my front. Because you're here every Sunday. Well, sometimes that's not always a blessing. Now, that doesn't mean you're not going to come to church anymore. But sometimes coming all the time or going to every potluck or signing up for every course isn't always a blessing because we run the risk of thinking that, well, maybe we already know everything that we need to know about God and we don't have to search anymore. And as effective as all the teachings may be in the church and everything that we've learned from our families and friends, sometimes we get into that rut of thinking. We already know all there is to know about God. Now, I know that I've already reminded you of this fact because in my epiphany homily, I said that. And I know that between Epiphany and Candlemas today, you have been reading the homily on your Kindle. You have it posted on your dashboard. You've memorized it. So this is kind of redundant, isn't it? But I'm reminding you again, after all, we're talking about seniors for some of us. Now, we may decide from here on in, because we're good churchgoers, that the Christian life is now primarily a matter of keeping a few rules that have been drilled into us, reciting the prayers we have learned, and that's it. But we delude ourselves. That gives us false hope. And when things do not work out for us spiritually or practically in life, we hold God accountable for not coming to our rescue. Almost as delusional as that kindergarten graduate who announced to his parents that he could now quit school because he had learned enough. Now that may have well served as the catchy title for Robert Fulcrum's book, All I Ever Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten, but it doesn't play very well in the library of life. It's been said that learning is a lifelong process. A lifelong process discernment. We need to take it seriously. And that's pretty scary to think of a lifelong process. We could hardly think of what we're going to have for dinner tonight or what snacks we have to prepare for the Super Bowl. How are we going to think of something that's lifelong? And if this is true in regard to maybe a particular subject or trade or craft, art or hobby, or even the whole world itself, then how much more is it true regarding our relationships with each other, with those we love, our husbands, our wives, our children, our grandchildren, our partners, and especially with our relationship with the infinite God in particular? You know, an infinite God can never fit into a finite box. And guess what? Our brains are finite boxes. At least mine is. You know, in other words, we're limited in our ability to understand anything, nevertheless, something that is infinite or divine. That's why faith, like learning, is a lifelong journey. So, if we're satisfied with the extent of our knowledge about God and what God has to do with our lives, then maybe we've stopped being on that journey and maybe we're comfortable with that. But if we're not satisfied and we want to grow and continue to discover and discern as much knowledge not only about God but about how we work inside and about how others work inside and especially how our kids work, if we'll ever figure that out, then what are you going to do to increase your knowledge. Now this is not to imply that we have to become theologians. It is more learning God than learning about God. And there's an important difference. It is more learning God than learning about God, kind of a circular approach to the knowledge of God. That means we really have to take 
an interest in learning the who of who you are and the me of who I am. Now, many of us have learned many things about George Washington. Maybe we're able to recite a list of facts concerning a sports figure or the Super Bowl stats this afternoon, a pop singer, a movie star. But that doesn't mean that we ever knew George Washington or any of the celebrities that we admire. Now, in our important relationships, those we love, those we associate with every day, Merely knowing about someone is not enough. We come to truly know a person through our experience of and with that individual. We need to be with that person. We need to look into their eyes. We need to hug them. We need to embrace them. We need to shake hands with them. We need to gaze into their eyes when we're talking with them not having a serious conversation and that other person sees your eyes go from here to there because you're not really interested. You can't text and you can't tweet another person and really get to know them. You have to experience who they are face to face. You are not learning about that person. You are learning that person as we learn God not about God. Pretty terrifying. Pretty big responsibility. And it is scary. Now we know our spouses. We know our family members. We know our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, not only because we write checks to them all the time, but we know them. We know our partners and those we love, our close friends. But you're not going to really know them and not know about them unless you spend time with them. Unless you are being with them, the times during which you experience who they are and who the God that created them meant them to be. Marriages sometimes fail and relationships sometimes end because people become satisfied with surface facts about the other. Our relationship with God can fail for the very same reason. Nothing less than experiencing God will enable us to move beyond knowing about God to knowing God. And maybe our vision of our God is a God of the yesteryear. Maybe it's a small God. Maybe it's a God in the sky, an elsewhere God, rather than an everywhere God who lives within us, within you and within me. So there's much we can learn from Simeon. And even though we have never met him, the mission of his life as he understood it was the same as our own life's purpose, which is to grow into a relationship with our God. Not that it's already finished, but to search, discern, and grow into a relationship with our God and with those we love, one another. St. Luke tells us that Simeon devoted his life to looking for God. So where do we focus our efforts? How much time we give to a relationship, be it human or divine, says something about how important that person is or that relationship is to us. Enter Anna. After telling us about Simeon, St. Luke introduces us to another senior citizen. Anna the prophet. Now why do we suppose Luke includes her in the story of Jesus being presented in the temple? Well, he doesn't tell us much more about Anna than he did about Simeon, but she too can teach us something about our faith. Whereas Simeon was about looking for God, Anna was about what to do with what we have learned about God. So she is a woman of action. She acted on what she knew. Now Anna, we are told, did do things. Like Simeon, she expressed her attitude to God, first of all. But second of all, we also read that she did not stop with gratitude. 
She told others about the God that she had experienced and about the child who was to be the redemption of Jerusalem and of the world. Now we can do that. That's not rocket science. You can witness to God. You can tell other people about God. Christianity is not just about saving our own souls. It is also about doing as Anna did, namely being a catalyst for other people to experience God and the gifts of God. That's evangelism. You can be an evangelist. You don't have to go on television, be in the Crystal Cathedral. You don't have to do any of that. You can do that. You can get others excited by what God has done for you. It's easy. Go to someone and say, ever heard about God? That's it. That's the end. You're an evangelist. It's easy. We need to excite others by that image that God has given us, and we need to image that God to other people. A light to lighten the Gentiles and to be the glory of your people Israel. That is what Simeon said. It is our nunc dimittis. Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace. That is why we burn the Easter candle, the light of Christ in the world. So you see, our relationship with God isn't meant to be very limited or parochial. It's not limited to a vertical God and me. That's all, just our personal Savior, which Christ is. But that's all. I'm going to hoard this God. It is meant to be triangular. And I know that psychiatrists say that triangularization is very unhealthy in life, very unhealthy and dysfunctional. Now it's good in the name of the Trinity because our relationship with God is triangular, God and me and thee. It is a relationship with the grace of God toward which we war work for our salvation together. Together. That's what the body of Christ is all about. Together as a community of faith. And that cannot happen unless we follow the example of Anna, unless we are willing to speak the message of Jesus to others. Now, this does not mean that we have to push our religion down the throats of those people we meet. It does mean, however, that we must be willing to weave God's message into our everyday conversation and everyday dialogue. How often, for example, when a discussion turns on the issue of helping the great percentage of Americans who earn below the national average of yearly income, are we willing to infuse into that conversation, into that bantering, something of the gospel message of caring for the poor? Or are we content to sit back while we are told that taking care of the poor might amount to socialism? In Matthew 25, Jesus told us that we are serving him as we take care of marginalized people. Matthew says, truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it unto me. What gospel values find their way into our conversation about health care for those who do not have it? What do we bring to the table when the discussion revolves around violence? These are the things Jesus talked about often, so they become the things that we need to address. If, like Anna, we are to tell others about God. Let us remember that in this morning's gospel, we are meeting these two seniors in the context of Jesus being presented in the temple by his parents. But in the gospel story, Jesus is also being presented to us, to you and to me. It is through him that we come to know God as Simeon did. 
And it is through his spirit that we are enabled to tell others as Anna did. So, we would do well this holy day to model ourselves after both of these wise senior citizens as we, you and I, continue to look, to search, to discern, to relate to, and to share the God we are coming to know. Amen. Must be a chicken fire. <laughs>